Hi, I'm Wanda Urbanska. In Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, there's a haunting sort of interlude in which the poet wanders the night. It's called The Sleepers. I wander all night in my vision, bending with open eyes over the shut eyes of sleepers. How solemn they look there, stretched and still. How quiet they breathe, the little children in their cradles. The night pervades them and enfolds them. I go from bedside to bedside. I sleep close with the other sleepers. I dream in my dream all the dreams of the other dreamers. Ah, oh, sleep, what a beautiful thing. If only we slept that well in the 21st century. How about you? How well did you sleep last night? If not very well, you're not alone. Researchers estimate that perhaps as many as one-third of us suffer from intermittent or chronic insomnia, the inability to initiate sleep or maintain sleep. And for those who can sleep, we're not sleeping enough. Seven hours on average, instead of the eight or eight and a half hours experts say most adults need. In other words, many of us don't value sleep. In our time-starved, work-driven lives, sleep gets short shrift. A physician who treats sleep-related problems, Dr. Walter Farr, first has to convince his patients that sleep is important. Sleep is critically important to good health, especially good mental health. If you don't get enough good quality sleep, you have lack of concentration during the day, increased moodiness, and lack of energy. Sleep also plays a vital role in strengthening your immune system. But I asked Dr. Farr, since so many of us are doing it, can't we just sort of get by with less sleep? Trying to do that is a mistake uh, because you build up a sleep deficit over time and most people can't tolerate that small amount of sleep. So what's the gold standard? What exactly do we mean when we say a good night's sleep? A healthy night's sleep is one where we go through cycles of light sleep, deep sleep, and then dream sleep, which is REM sleep, about every 90 minutes throughout the night. In pursuit of that golden night of sleep, Many of us are checking into sleep labs. Dr. Jan Kriska treats patients at one such lab in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Uh, we would be uh, checking your uh, brain waves to see what the stage of the sleep you, you're in. We would be checking your uh, oxygen levels if, you, if that stays okay throughout the night. Uh, EKG, we'll be watching uh, or measuring your motion of, of the chest and, um, and, and, and abdomen. We will be checking your uh, feet for motion, if you have any restlessness. Uh, we would be also checking uh, the, the motion of your air um, with a special device called thermocouple. Sleep labs can diagnose and often effectively treat sleep problems, particularly a breathing disorder called sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome, another physiological cause of poor sleep. For many of us, though, the solution begins with the recognition that insomnia is frequently linked with distinctly unsimple lifestyles. Fortunately, there's plenty of practical wisdom these days about strategies, among them herbal remedies that can lead to better and longer sleep. Now here are the old woolly heads who Ma and Pop and maybe Uncle Fred counted as a last resort. When all else fails, there are these guys. And there's this guy, Homeland Security for the sheep, the llama. 902, 903, 904. And maybe this works for you, but believe me, counting sheep is not at the top of the list of effective strategies. At the very top, if you can rule out depression and anxiety, which are two leading underlying causes of insomnia, are evening rituals before bedtime that calm you down, that make you gentle as a, well, a lamb. As much as possible, follow a regular bedtime schedule. Make sure you stop working or even thinking about work long before bedtime. Turn off that computer and that television set and carve out some quiet time for yourself. Read a book, take a hot bath, pray or meditate, 
anything you can do to get calm and centered, and do all of these things in low, tranquil light. Avoid late dinners, and, says Dr. Farr, be smart about what you drink and when you drink it. First of all, you want to avoid things that make you more alert late at night, and these include too much caffeine earlier in the day. In general, over three or four cups of coffee during the day will lead to some level of higher arousal late at night, making it difficult to either get to sleep or stay asleep well. So Too much fluids after 6 p.m. and alcohol. Alcohol is an enemy of sleep, although it makes you drowsy initially. <laughs> Second half of the night, it makes you more alert and it uh, ruins your sleep quality. You should uh, drink one or two drinks at most and at mealtime, nothing like a nightcap. A nightcap ruins your sleep. Another key to healthy sleep is the sleep environment itself. Cool, yes, studies show we sleep better at cooler temperatures. Avoid watching television in bed and keep things quiet. If there's outside noise, use a source of white noise like this machine. Then there's the factor we often neglect, ambient light. Based in Northern California, Carol Vanolia is the author of Healing Environments. It's actually getting harder and harder to have a dark bedroom because of street lights. And then also if you've got, you know, alarm clocks and other things in the bedroom that, that have those, those little, you know, lit up clocks and that kind of thing. Um, one researcher, one sleep researcher says, if you can see your hand a foot away from your face in the bedroom, it's too light. Now this factor may seem self-evident, but it's often easy to lose sight of the basics. And again, when you do it is key. A good exercise level is wonderful for sleep, particularly if it's uh, earlier in the day. As with our other uh, rules of sleep, you don't want to do anything right before bed that gets you too excited or alert. Now what about your kids? Like my 10-year-old Henry here, how much sleep do they need? Youngsters need at least eight hours of sleep, and unfortunately, teenagers need even more time to sleep in order to function well. Many Americans, of course, hope drugs can help them sleep. We spend $2 billion a year betting on that hope, but Dr. Farr warns us to beware of over-the-counter medications. A better strategy may just be herbal remedies. Many people swear by them. Despite being editor-in-chief of the magazines Herbs for Health and Herb Companion, K.C. Compton was initially skeptical that herbal remedies could cure her chronic insomnia. A year and a half ago, she started taking them. Well, my nightly ritual has become that I will make myself a cup of hot tea and I will have uh, chamomile or, um, or chamomile or lemon balm, which is a great one for relaxing. Um, so there are a number of, of different kinds of very relaxing teas and just the process itself is very comforting of making of the tea preparing. and preparing the tea. And then, but I also take a tincture, just like a dropper a half of a dropper full of um, remedy that's called deep sleep. And that has valerian and uh, California poppy and hops and passion flower. And those are all really, really powerful sleep-inducing herbs. I feel like an infant. It's like, well, she's sleeping through the night now, you know, <laughs> but really, that, that's a big accomplishment. All right, now suppose you've tried all these things we've been talking about, including counting these guys, and you're still awake. What are you supposed to do? Just lie awake and be miserable? If you can't get to sleep after 20, 25 minutes, go ahead and get out of bed. Do, do something relaxing at a low light level, such as reading a book. Then when you're drowsy, go ahead and get back in bed. Whatever you do, don't look at the alarm clock. In other words, don't look to see what time it is. It's a head game, usually competing against our own brain. In that regard, Dr. Jan Kriska offers this suggestion. Do not obsess about it, because that's when you get yourself into trouble, because you 
kind of like you're not falling asleep and then you just, I mean, I, but I gotta fall asleep and then you overstimulate yourself even more and then you have a hard time falling asleep. So if you're gonna have a problem, just relax and try to uh, take it easy. Well, you've probably seen enough of me out here in my PJs with my new buddies here. Hi guys, you're very soporific. Thank you. But I do hope you've learned a few things, as I have, about sleeping well. Mom was right, you know, we do need our sleep. And as we'll discover in the next segment, our elders have much to teach us. So remember, acknowledge the importance of sleep. Particularly for physiological disorders, consider a sleep lab. Establish bedtime rituals to calm you down and stick to them. As the day goes on, go easy on that caffeine and alcohol and create a sleep environment that's dark and quiet as possible. We're living so stretched thin in our daily grind. Longer work hours, houses to maintain, meals to prepare, kids to shuttle. With the breakneck speed of modern life, time with elders often falls by the wayside. Yet, forging a deep connection with people who have learned life's lessons over the years can be the most valuable investment you make. A native of Poland who moved with her family to the United States in 1961, Dr. Aldana Vosch is the former U.S. ambassador to Estonia. The experience and wisdom of Aldana's parents, Paul and Wanda Vosch, have played a key role in Aldana's success as a diplomat, physician, wife, and mother of twins. A member of the Polish Home Army in World War II, Paul Vosch and his parents saved the lives of 12 Jews, smuggling them out of the Jewish ghetto with a horse and wagon only days before they would have been sent to their deaths in the concentration camp. It was an act of extraordinary courage, one of thousands by Polish Christians three million of whom themselves died in the war. Very uh, risky situation. For yourselves? For, for all my family. If somebody uh, discover we doing something like this, and German know about this, that was uh, dead. You and your whole family would have been killed. Absolutely. If somebody help any way, food, uh, clothes, money, or, or sleeping water, if it was this, uh, this, uh, discovered, was shot. And in other countries, the Not same a, punishment didn't apply? No, no. Only in Poland. Many Polish people lose own life hiding the Jewish people. We was in the same situation, only we was lucky. We was never discovered. A year later, Paul Vosch was captured in the Warsaw Uprising, in which some quarter million Polish Christians died. He was sent to a concentration camp. Long after the war had ended, Paul Vosch's active courage was acknowledged in Israel, where he was honored as a righteous Gentile. Aldana, Paul's daughter, has taken to heart her parents' ethic of helping others no matter what and she's an impassioned champion of the value of elders. Elders offer in society knowledge. And that knowledge, if we take the time to listen to elders, we may learn incredible things. And we can learn incredible things that actually may allow us to get to our goals much quicker. As she was growing up, mealtime in the Vosch family was prime time for engagement with elders. The discussions were always serious. Yeah. Were always serious. It was, it was in reference to, to history, to current events, to, to, from strength of character to morality, to politics, to religion. They were always serious subjects. We really lose sight of the fact that sharing a meal 
with the family brings to light many things, whether we can share our problems, our successes of the day, whether we can speak about the current events or perhaps the future. It is something that we are, I think, as a society in the United States, not paying attention to that. And it requires effort to have a meal with your children at the same time every day. Aldana makes that happen, and raising her own children now, Aldana takes satisfaction in the fact that yet another generation will learn the wisdom of her elders. Like their mother, Aldana's children have learned the rewards of discipline at a very early age. I remember my father coming to the uh, post-op uh, uh, room in the, in, in the hospital when my children were born. And my father came in and he was given a seat right by me and he started to cry. I didn't know what to say. I held his hand and he said, I thank God that I'm here alive to see this day. And you realize that everything that parents envision comes to life with a grandchild. One man who treasures the wisdom of elders is Ken Lowe, president and CEO of the media giant E.W. Scripps. Ann Vaughn introduced Ken this way in his hometown of Mount Airy, North Carolina to our generous and gracious hometown hero, Ken Lowe. I sat down with the creator of HGTV, the home and garden television network, and many other media ventures to ask him what he'd learned from these two elders who'd come to hear him speak, his own parents, Wayne and Barbara Lowe. Ken grew up on a farm a few miles outside of town. Now a dying way of life, Tobacco farming has always extracted a pound of flesh from its practitioners. As you know, I grew up on a farm, and honestly, I wasn't too crazy about it, but <laughs> we were primarily raising tobacco, and uh, anybody that's ever worked in tobacco or worked in picking cotton, that's very hard work. What Ken got from his parents, he says, was not only his work ethic, but also what he calls the foundation of his character. They're an example, I think, of the type of people that really make this country what it is. Honest people who've worked very hard, who've really tried to hold their family together, uh, who believe very strongly in their faith, and believe very strongly in uh, being compassionate towards other people. And uh, again, they're pretty simple lessons. They're not overly complicated. And uh, the one thing they, they have always done is surrounded me and my late brother with love. Something told me Ken's parents might just be a wee bit proud of their son. I sat down with them in the country store that Wayne's father operated, now restored. Turns out that's not the only thing Ken's parents have restored. A 10-year-old Ken Lowe started putting together his own homemade radio station. Of course, you know, at that time, uh, me and Barbara both was working and we, you know, a kid, you, you just let them have their way and, uh, you know, just let them go on. So that's what we did. And he would, uh, he would get money from his uh, grandmother and to go buy these little pieces for this radio station back here in the back. And so we, we still, you know, just let him go on and have his way. And, and the first thing you know, he had the radio station built. He was just a smart boy growing up. He, uh... He was a hard worker, even as a child. He, um, he would listen to, uh, as far as getting into the radio, he would listen to these big radio stations at night. And uh, so, first thing we knew, he was asking his grandmother for $5 when her social security check came to order a part from Lafayette, uh, a radio shack. Tell me what WGOB stands for. Well, you know what Jeb, WGOB stands for. Gobs of Fun. <laughs> <laughs> and he had Gobs of Fun doing it. Oh, yes, he had Gobs of Fun doing it. But he, that radio signal, you could pick it up for mm -hmm. 
Quite two miles. Lot. I'd get in my automobile and drive down the road two miles, and it would be just as plain as uh, the stations on the air now. So what did he play, or did he broadcast the news? To, to, tell oh, yes. me. He had a schedule, a little schedule. He had a friend to help him, and uh, he had the time of day that uh, one of them would be on the air and give the news. We just thought he was just uh, something playing or doing something. We didn't realize that he was going to have a radio station that he could go out on the air with. These days, Ken Lowe's broadcast range is a tad more than two miles. His parents, though, are modest about the influence of their wisdom on him. Ken Lowe visits his parents often, staying in this room when he comes. His younger brother, Bruce, died just a few years ago, giving Ken all the more reason to stay in close touch with mom and dad. We know how busy he is, so he, we know he makes a lot of effort to get home, but he calls just about every day. He calls us often. The Lowe family is a great example of another form of elder wisdom, that which is passed down in the culture of small town America. It's less common than it used to be, but so many of our national leaders have come from small towns, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter among them. Small town culture, like that of Plains, Georgia, has much to teach us. The Plains does uh, change to accommodate modern times, but we cling to certain things that never change. And I think one thing that we've done extraordinary in an extraordinary way in playing just to, is to let the appearance of our town ex exemplify life during the Great Depression years. And the Park Service has done an outstanding job here. Plains, the entire town of Plains is a historic site, as well as the boyhood home. And, and I think the average uh, child, we have thousands of children come here every year, and, and they're adults with them, the parents and grandparents. Th they really experience how life was during those simple years uh, when people stayed close to home, they, they worked for a living, they didn't waste anything, they utilized the, the finest aspects of life based on simplicity and dedication. They, they conserved uh, what God gave them they felt like they were stewards of the earth. And so we, we hope to embed in the consciousness of people, whether they stay here one day or stay here a week, those kind of concepts of life as it used to be. I hope you've enjoyed our glimpse into one of the richest and simplest of treasures we possess, the wisdom of our elders. Now we'll close our show on some beautiful faces. And as we do, remember nothing, nothing's too small to make a difference. Until next time, I'm Wanda Urbanska. So remember, take time to listen to elders and apply what they teach to your life. Whenever you can, eat meals with other generations, both younger and older. Reflect on the core values, the foundation your elders have given you, and take time to honor that gift with them. And learn from the traditional wisdom of small towns. Waste less, be good stewards, help one another.